We are in our series called The Holy One. We are studying the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, together, we're in Isaiah chapter 29 this morning. If you have a pew Bible, I believe that's on page 341 for the regular print. And if you have a large print, that's page 657. Isaiah 29, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 24. And while you are turning, I will... Uh, Bring us to the Lord in prayer over the text and our time together in the Word. Father, thank you for your Word, which is light to us. It is a sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to penetrate our heart, our soul, um, and to even identify our motives. Lord, I pray that our, the state of our week, the state of our minds right now, the state of our life right now, Lord, would all come under the power and the... Um, anointing of your word to change us, to make us more like you, to give us hope in hopelessness and despair, and to heal brokenness. Lord, we ultimately invite you, Holy Spirit, to be with us, to be on the process of us reading your word and be in our hearts to transform us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 29, 13 through 24. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and the fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me? Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. Is it, it is not yet a very little while until Lebanon, is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off, who by a word make a man out to be an offender, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right. Therefore, says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. Jacob shall no more be ashamed. No more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the, whole, of God, of the God of Israel. And those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding. And those who murmur will accept instruction. This is God's word. Have you ever questioned your faith? And what I mean by questioning it is its reality, its validity, or its relevance to the rest of your life, to the day-to-day -day humdrum of life. Leo Tolstoy, the Russian novelist of a century and a half ago, who grew up in the church, the Orthodox Church, and in his early 50s had this existential crisis after he had written most of his famous works, including War and Peace, the, one of the longest novels translated into English. He had this crisis of wondering the meaning of his life. And he reflects in his confessions about his childhood. 
and the irrelevance of the faith which he, which he received. You see, he was reflecting, he starts off in his confessions, and he says he never really believed seriously the faith that he was given. He just blindly followed, casually followed the instruction of the elders. And he remembers this point in at high school, a boy came and announced the discovery that in school, there really is no God. It was all just an invention. And he recalls feeling, this is exciting news. But even as his faith has, had waned and declined and he was reflecting further on its relevance to his life, here's what he says in his confessions, his confession. He says this, perhaps you'll relate. The decline of my faith occurred in the way in which it has always happened and still happens among those from our kind of background. It seems to me that in the majority of instances, it happens like this. People live as everyone lives, but on the basis of principles that not only have nothing in common with religious doctrines, but are on the whole contrary to them. Religious doctrine plays no part in life or in relations between people. Neither are we confronted with it in our personal lives. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying religion is effectively irrelevant. Faith is irrelevant. The reason why people lose faith is because it has no bearing on real life. You could say this. Religion in which his heart, well, religion in which he experienced, which he experienced, was one where his heart was distant from God. If you've ever felt that, if you've ever wondered, if you've ever questioned your faith, this text is for you. The title of the message today is The Holy One's Promise to the Disconnected. The Holy One's Promise to the Disconnected. So, as we'll see in the text here, we need to understand, number one, the disconnected heart. What is it? And then secondly, ways we sever that connection. How does it become disconnected? Thirdly, the promised reconnection. The disconnected heart, ways we sever the connection, the promised reconnection. As we've been looking uh, at the prophet Isaiah, we've really been highlighting this attribute of God that he in a, in a unique way, experiences the holiness of God. It, it shapes his whole ministry. It shapes the language of the text. We see a reference to the Holy One of Israel, that phrase, or a derivative, the Holy One of Jacob, 26 times in this book, whereas it only occurs six other times in all the rest of the Old Testament. Isaiah had this encounter in the presence of God, and he saw the holiness of God, and he realized his need to be atoned for because of his own sinful ways. And that transformed his life and his ministry and is impacting us here today. So let's look at the first point, this disconnected heart. Isaiah's ministry and his initial calling, his initial uh, commission, excuse me, was to a people whose heart condition is summarized in this text, and it's actually in verse 13. Verse 13 says, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. It's a summary of the heart condition of 8th century Judah and Israel. And and subsequently, centuries since then, and even into the present, for many. And notice, well, we didn't read, I mean, we read it earlier, but I didn't just read verse 14. There is a, in verse 13, because, and in verse 14, a therefore. We'll get to the therefore, but let's look at the the because. And in fact, let's look closely at the text. Look at the, the sort of descriptions of the people. I mean, on the one level, on the surface level, these are actually very positive attributes. People who draw near, the phrase, draw near. Secondly, honor me. Thirdly, fear of me. If you were to extract those three phrases, those are actually the things that we should do. 
all believing people, all faithful people should draw near to God. They should honor God. They should fear God. In fact, we've talked about it last week. The fear of God we talked about is the thing we need to overcome all other fears. So what's the problem? The problem is all of this was just lip service. The problem is it was all, I could say the right things, but I don't really mean it. The problem was there was a heart disconnect. It was insincere worship. It was going through the motions. So as it says in the middle sort of that verse, verse 13, while their hearts are far from me. On the surface, they're doing all the things. They're sacrificing all the sacrifices. They're showing up at all the feasts. They're praying all the prayers. They're being present in all the assemblies. But their heart didn't really mean it. It was like Tolstoy. It had no relevance to everyday life. What does a heart disconnect look like? There's many examples. If you were to just broad categorize it, you could say it's dead religion or false religion, in other words, other religions, or fake religion, or just any type of religious duty, service, performance, participation that lacks real power or true relationship. A disconnected heart is, is given to us, if you're familiar with the very famous parable, we often refer to it as the prodigal son, but really it's a parable of two sons found in Luke's gospel in chapter 15. And in that particular parable, the one son is a wayward son, and he goes off and he takes the inheritance and he treats his father as if he were dead, and he goes and he squanders it all on wanton living, the text says. It says that he comes to his senses and he wants to sort of regain this dishonoring uh, relationship with his father, and he goes and he says, I will basically beg to be brought back into the house as a servant, one not living present, but one who will sort of work his way back into good graces. Yet the older son, who does all the right things, who never leaves home, who never squanders anything, who doesn't go off in wanton living, he's the one who's the most distant in heart. He's the one when the, old, the, the, the son who came home was being celebrated was saying, I will never come inside to celebrate him. Look at what all I have done, but you never honored me, and yet you honor him. You see, we often think of the irreligious, the atheist, if you will, the secular, as examples of those whose hearts are disconnected from God. And while that is true, the parable of the two sons in this text remind us that the religious are just as guilty and perhaps more deceived about how far their hearts are from the living God. In the first century, the time where the uh, New Testament is written, and in the New Testament, the Gospels and the, the writings about the ministry of our Lord Jesus, Jesus confronts the religious elite of his day. And in fact, he quotes Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, in Matthew's gospel in, verse, in chapter 15, where he talks about how Isaiah was right. You do all this stuff, and it means nothing. In fact, he was critiquing the religion because they cared more about the outward expression of rule keeping than they did for the people they were demanding to keep the rules. In other words, they had no mercy. They only wanted judgment. They only wanted people to do all the right things on the outside, but their hearts themselves were distant from God. This is what a disconnected heart looks like, a heart disconnect. Presently, what it might look like for you is this. You might say, my faith has no bearing on my work, on my studies. I go to church. I'm in church for a few minutes out of the week, 
and then I go back and I do my thing. It's like I'm living in two worlds. I think about those in politics, we're in that season, but those that would say, you know, my faith really has no bearing on what I do. And in the context of when that is said, usually they're trying to appeal to people across a broad spectrum. But if you really think about what they're saying, you're wondering, well, what does? What? And, and beyond politics, for all of us, what is the thing that determines what you do? What is driving how you view your work? What is driving how you relate to your family? How you deal with your studies? What your aspirations are, your goals are? What is the thing that drives that? Now, I do want to offer one caveat. Because we could say, you know, this, this reality of a heart that's distant from God, of a religion that is without power or relationship, could be true of both a nom- newly nominal Christian or one who has walked with God for a significant time. Yet I want a caveat because perhaps you're in a season of your life where you could say, you know, I just don't feel it. I don't know if I feel it. And, and you could incur uh, an unnecessary amount of condemnation. And I want to caution us from being overly subjective about this because Scripture never really says that your feelings dictate either the validity or the vitality of your faith. Never really says that. And in fact, Scripture even curbs our over-reliance on our own knowledge of God as an indicator that we have received a salvation because it often reverses the knowledge, relationship, direction by saying, you are known by God. That's how you know. In other words, it's not just that you know God, it's that He knows you. And though I could feel one day I'm here or the next day that I'm here, His knowledge of me never changes. So my feelings could change, but my status doesn't. My knowledge could change, but my status doesn't. And I want to caution us to not take this too far. But we do need to wrestle with where our hearts are. How does the Lord respond to this condition? So in verse 13, we see the condition, the heart condition, but how does He respond? Now, I, I, I want to remind us, I mean, we're not doing a Bible study. We are preaching through Isaiah. There are 66 chapters. We could be here for a while. I've chosen to not go that route because many of you will graduate before we ever finished. But I want to acknowledge, we've skipped a major section of the book. So starting in chapters 13 and going forward, there's this major section where God is issuing forth judgment of all the various nations in, in the Middle East, the, the region, the known world, if you will. And in fact, earlier in this particular chapter, God has he's promised Judah, hey, I'm going to judge you. In fact, he says, I'm going to seize, siege you. I'm going, to, I'm going to surround you. And he's talking about the judgment to come. And, and in one sense, there's this localized reality where Assyria is going to come and seize Jerusalem. Pastor John will preach about that next week. And then there's this a sort of more distant reality where Babylon is going to come. Assyria doesn't conquer Judah. It does wipe out the northern kingdom. But then Babylon's going to come and wipe them out. And God's saying, yeah, that was me. That's me. When you see this happen, it's me and it's judgment because of all of your distant religion, all of your waywardness, all of your idolatry. I've warned you for years and years. I told you before you would come into the promised land this would happen. So judgment has come. But now he says in verse 14, Behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people. With wonder upon wonder, the wisdom of their wise shall, men shall perish, and the discernment of the discerning men will be hidden. In other words, God's promising salvation. So you think about what we just laid down as a foundation here, understanding these are people whose hearts are far from God. Maybe, and you, you might admit, yeah, that's me. I feel that disconnect. I feel like I'm just sort of going through motions here. There's good news for you. 
God promises after judgment their salvation. There's something powerful. Wonders. I'm going to do wonderful things again. What is he talking about? Well, the wonderful things God has done is he, he took his people who were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, and through his mighty hand, he delivered them through the plagues. He gripped the heart of Pharaoh, who already hardened his own heart. The Lord hardened it further so he could show his miraculous power and deliver his people. Not one was lost. They crossed the Red Sea. He provided for them in the wilderness, manna and quail, every single day. These are the wonders. And there's a more immediate trajectory of these wonders that the Lord speaks of. Yes, I am going to judge you. You're going to be taken into exile, but I will bring you back. That's salvation. And yet, when we look in a moment at the description of what that salvation means... Clearly, the return of exile is not the fulfillment in its fullness. It's only when Jesus comes and ultimately when he returns, we receive it. Judgment first, then then salvation. Okay, how do we get the salvation? How 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 do we see these wonders? How does this change our heart? How does this transform us? Well, before we get to that, we have to look at the second point. How do we sever the connection, the ways that we sever it? You see, in verse 15, we get this effectively a woe, and then in 16, he's describing that in a little further detail. Verse 15 says, All, uh, ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are dark, are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? He's saying, You sever the connection when you make plans that depend on you. When you functionally act as if God is not there. And in the original context here, probably the plan is because they know Assyria's coming, we need help, Let, let's go talk to Egypt. Let's go, and don't tell the Lord, let's go get Egypt on board with us so we'll be protected. Now, it doesn't explicitly say that here, but if you, turn, if you just looked at chapter 30, that's where the Lord goes. Woe to those who trust in Egypt instead of trusting in me. It's making plans. It's like if you make plans and if you're not really cognizant spiritually or mentally that the Lord is there, you're not really counting on him. It'd be like on the playing field if a quarterback calls a huddle, but he doesn't invite a wide receiver. Clearly, the play is not going to him, right? I'm not counting on you to get us the first down. We do that with the Lord when we don't include him in our plans. But he further illuminates this, verse 16. You turn things upside down. He's talking about the condition of the heart, the one that's far removed from him, that could say all the right things, but the heart is far away. He says three things here in verse 16. Shall the potter be regarded as clay? That's number one. Secondly, the thing that made say of its maker, he didn't make me. Thirdly, or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. Now, they all say the same thing, but they all actually are saying something slightly different. The thing that they're all saying is, You're distorting the distinction between the creator and the created. You see, the scripture gives this very clear boundary. There is God in three persons who has lived for all of eternity. He created all things, who himself is uncreated. And there is us. We are finite, fallible, in need of help. God needs no help. We are malleable, we are clay, he is potter, he is immutable, he never changes. And yet, in distancing our hearts from him, we flip it, we turn it all upside down. How does that work? Well, regarding the potter as clay, what does that mean? What is the property of clay? You, you, you know, remember those projects in elementary school and you go and you make a funny va- you know, thing for mom and then you stick it in the urn and it pops out and it's like, oh, thank you. That's funny. Well, I've always wanted one of those. 
Clay's malleable. We flip it and we make God to be the one that's malleable. How does that work? Well, it works a few ways. Here's one. How about when you read Scripture and you find something or you hear Scripture, you hear something talked about in Scripture, and yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't think I like that. Maybe, maybe okay, that probably doesn't apply anymore. Um, let's, make it, let, you know, let's make it say this, or let's think of it in this way. What are you doing? You're bending God's will to fit yours. You're making Him change to fit you as the one who doesn't change. Your disconnect, your disconnect from your heart, heart, it says effectively this. You say, God, I'm yours. I surrender to you. But what you're really saying is, under the condition that you support my happiness. Do you see that? Do you see the disconnect? That's not really, okay, I'm not really for you, God. It's just only in this condition. Remember, I'm the center. You change to fit me. Secondly, the thing says of its maker, he didn't make me. How does that play out? Well, rather than saying God is sovereign over me, that's what the potter is. He's sovereign over the clay. And rather than saying I belong to him, because the clay certainly belongs to, proprietarily speaking, the, the one who makes it, forms it. Instead of saying God is sovereign over me and I belong to him, you believe or act, at least, as if you belong to yourself and you're sovereign over yourself. You sever the connection of heart. Lord, I worship you, but I want to call my own shots. I want to dictate how it goes, what my career path looks like, what my life will look like, how my relationships will go. And then this final piece. The thing form says of him who formed it, he has no understanding. In other words, you might think, maybe you don't articulate these words, but you might think, God just does not understand my life. He doesn't get it. It's, my life's so complicated. It's too, he clearly can't help me. So therefore, I'm on my own. Do you see that? Do you see the distancing? you see how we flip it, turn it upside down? We sever the heart connection from God when we make him out to be the clay and us to be the potter. And in the process, you lose true worship. You could say all the right things, but your heart's not there. Now, what's common to all of these aspects, all of these, these, these things from 15 and 16? You, you know, you have hidden plans. You think God can't see them. You make God to be malleable. You worship, um, you know, Him only on the condition He supports your happiness. You think He doesn't make me. He didn't make me. I'm sovereign over my life. You say He has no understanding. And no, he can't counsel or shepherd me. I'm on my own. What's common about all these things? The common denominator is this, as it pertains to your heart, the person sitting on the throne of your heart is you. That's what's common. And and therefore, what you've done is you've dethroned God, the Holy One, the one who, who is rightfully there, should sit on the throne, does not sit there. And so we could say this, woe is, woe to you who dethrone the Holy One and put yourself on the throne of your own heart. Let's think about the promised reconnection. And as we think about that, I want to offer, so here's just sort of like a case study of two examples of one, a heart that need, needs more transforming and needed more transforming, and one that truly is transformed, because that's what we're talking about. Th- this promised reconnection is, is talking about a religion or a faith that actually sees power. Transform your life. You're not the same. You are a new creation. Now, the first, this is a case study. So the first, these are real people, by the way. Um, the first is a well-known, infamous pastor at this point. Um, and lots of things have been reported about him. And anyways, in, in this sort of fallout of the church that he had built, which was one of the largest and fastest growing at the time, and he had a well-known persona, he talks about, he talked about how before he was a Christian, he was a street fighter, and he would win all the fights. 
But what's interesting is that when he became a pastor, he was still winning all the fights. He said all the right things. I mean, well, he said a lot of right things. There are lots of actual lives transformed through his ministry. But deep in his heart, something didn't get changed. The same desire for power, it never got checked. It never got, it never got, the gospel never got there. It remained dark, hidden. Conversely, if you've ever heard of the figure George Mueller, he lived in the 19th century, born in uh, Germany and ended up doing an orphanage in England. And before he became a Christian, he was a swindler. He, he, would, he would trick you out of your money if you knew him. He would, he would give you a great story, oh, I, you know, and then take it. And, but he was all, all the time robbing Peter to pay Paul. In other words, he owed this guy money. I'm taking it from you. I'm going to go pay him back and just keep that going. Until he finally met Jesus. Jesus radically changed his life. And if you're familiar with George Mueller, if you've ever studied, you know, missionary work and that sort of thing, not only was he an owner of an orphanage and did he start this orphanage as he saw the plight of children on the streets um, in 19th century England, he effectively made a vow. He never asked anyone for money. He only asked God. Now, I've raised money before, and you look at that. Now, is that a, should we all do that? No. He wasn't doing that as a, everyone, but he did it because, hey, I used to swindle people. I'm not doing that anymore. I've met Jesus. I can just ask God. He'll provide. It's, it's a powerful story. But do you see the heart change? Do you see the transformation? Do you see the difference between the two? Okay, here's the promise. The promise is, first of all, just in light of all that's happening in the Middle East now, this is very strangely relevant text. Verse 17, is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? Now, this is a physical representation of the spiritual transformation that God's talking about. What he's saying is, effectively, listen, effectively, in sort of dumbing it down, if you will, for my sake, not yours, um, that I could take a field, there's no life going on there, and make it into a forest. And if, as, as, as I could do that, I could take a heart that is far from me, that says all the right things, and turn it into a fire, one on fire for me. Turn it into one who truly honors, truly knows me, truly reveres me. That's what he's saying. See, this is hope if you have a lag in your faith, if you feel complacent or apathetic or feeling stuck. But here's the things that he says, and I'm just going to read through them quickly. This is the promised salvation, verse 18. The deaf will hear, the blind will see, verse 19. The meek will have joy, the poor will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Verse 20. The ruthless, there's going to be justice. Finally, the people in power who keep abusing their power are going to come to nothing. The scoffer will cease. All who watch to do evil will be cut off. Those who, who pervert justice, even in the legal sense, those who go to the gate where matters are discerned and they try to pervert justice by making the righteous person out to be the guilty person and the guilty person out to be the righteous person, I'm wiping it all out. And furthermore, Jacob, we use the phrase, you know, so-and-so is probably rolling over in his grave. Well, Isaiah is like, Jacob's probably rolling over in his grave thinking about where you guys are right now. But one day, because he's, you know, no more be ashamed, verse 22, no more fa uh, face grows pale. He's going to see his children, the work of my hands, the Lord says, and they will sanctify me. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Even those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. That's the promise. 
That's the promise for you. Now, how does that promise happen? What, how does this happen? How does God take a heart that's so distant and transform it into one that's so present with him? Well, as I said before, we're talking about Jesus, what he came to do. You see, as the passage, if we read the whole, tech, uh, the whole chapter 29, judgment first, then salvation. Judgment first, then salvation. The Son of God comes and he is judged for your wayward heart and mine so that salvation could come to you. The, 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 the judgment for the people in the text was first exile, then return. The judgment for Jesus, he became an exile of heaven, living here on earth. And he has a greater judgment in that their judgment was, well, you're taken away from your land. And though Jesus heart was never far from his father, but always had the father sitting on the throne of his heart. On the cross, he was taken away and he was judged. He was forsaken so that you could receive salvation. And, in, 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 as you study it, as you study the wonder of what the gospel is, as you know, come to know the wonder of who Jesus is, you become one who, as Isaiah promises, will sanctify the Holy One, will sanctify His name, will stand in awe of the Lord. So I conclude, do you feel disconnected from God? Do you feel like your faith has no bearing on other parts of your life? Do you feel like you're going through the motions? I encourage you to examine your heart because this could be an indication you've dethroned the Holy One. But I encourage you because there is hope in His salvation and what Jesus did to take your judgment so that you could be invited either for the first time or for the hundred thousandth time as a believer back to his nearness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the goodness of who you are, that you are creator of all things, possessor of all things, that we are the clay in your hands. I pray, Father, in ways in our lives that we resist your shaping and molding and moving and changing of us, Help us where we respond by wanting to just mold you to fit our own needs or desires. Lord, let us truly surrender to the goodness and the beauty of the salvation you offer us in Jesus. Whether we are not a believer or whether we have been one, Lord, would you continue to transform our hearts? In Jesus' name we pray.